Even after two years in Sidit theaters, Paranorman still managed to have the same charm that captivated me the first time. It combines great animation and good characters with story. Its message on acceptance and bullying was handled so well that it still managed to move me every time I see it. While the idea of kids fighting monsters isn't anything new, the movie works on so many levels that it practically improved on this oddly specific genre. But instead of watching Paranorman, I was watching another horror-themed animated movie with similar characters, similar backstory, and similar message, but pales by comparison. Mainly with its problem with its tone. Paranorman was so decisive on who it was aimed for, with this movie, you just can't say the same. So without further ado, let us watch Monster House. So our movie begins with the girl from the cover art of some old corn album, and you might notice something about the animation style. It's creepy to look at. Not too long ago, Robert Zemeckis ran a failed company whose films were mostly animated through motion capture. While the technique allows for the movement of actors to be translated much like an improved form of rotoscope, it can leave the result to seem very uncanny as mentioned in a previous editorial on animation that aims too much for realism. It's where that expression of dead eyes and animated characters came from. We look like ghosts. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We see here intrude the house of... Yep, Steve Buscemi happens to be one of my favorite actors for a number of reasons. Despite how he has such a distinct voice and appearance that one could imagine would limit his acting capabilities, this isn't the case. He surprisingly has range that allows him to shift between different personalities. Each character he plays is so distinct that comparing two yields different results. This movie, as we'll see later, is a testament to that. He's an old grouch with the creative name of Nebercracker, who chases kids off his yards when toys are accidentally thrown there. He's like the Beast from the Sandlot, which we could all agree is more dignified than seeing him in Home on the Range. I gave up clown college for this? We learn that one of the kids following Nebercracker is your generic prepubescent protagonist who has a hunch that his neighbor holds a dark secret. He's also the actor who played Hannah Montana's best friend, but I'm just bringing that up to make two Hannah Montana jokes continuously after another. But his parents go away on a business trip leaving him duped with a babysitter, one of the Jake Gyllenhaals. You know, the one that looks like Droopy. His best friend is another character knocked off from the Sandlot, the token fat kid by the name of Chowder. And they're not too obvious. Yeah, remember when I said that most motion capture relies on the actor's performance, but because there's no background and environment, it could leave the final product to look awkward and out of place? Well, there you go. As you'll notice, the jokes in this film range from mediocre to pretty sad, especially since one of the writers of the screenplay is Dan Harmon. Yeah, that Dan Harmon. Other than the connection that he has a hard-on for Halloween slash horror-themed stuff, it's clear how he'd get attached to a project like this. But even then he had his problems. Even going as far as complaining how producers Steven Spielberg and Robert Zemeckis ruined his original draft. Kinda having mixed feelings on this, since animation is comprised of more than one writer given the time it takes to produce a movie versus live action. But yeah, with a device of humor like this... Show's gonna last three weeks! Six seasons and a movie! I guess I am a little annoyed. Also, Dan Harmon complaining on the internet is nothing new. It's like every Tuesday, if you ask me. When the plot device Chowder was playing with gets stuck on Nebercracker's yard, it's our hero TJ's opportunity to show that something's up. And it results with Nebercracker getting a heart attack. I'm a murderer. No, you're not. I'm not? When it's an accident, they call it manslaughter. Uh, no. You... Don't see them call a time of death or drop a drape over him. I'm pretty sure he's not dead. Well, truth be told, with the awkward motion capture, him looking lifeless is about as convincing as him looking alive. And there's a reveal to the house being alive. You'd figure the reveal would be something subtle, like the scene when TJ's sleeping, and the shadow of the Master Hand from Super Smash Bros. screwing with him. 
which could give us the illusion that it could be real, or part of his imagination. But no, the grass and the house move with a lack of subtlety. But it's not the last of the house shenanigans. It begins to take captives and starts going crazy. Funny that most of the time this is happening is in broad daylight. Do you think anybody else would be able to catch this? This isn't like Michigan J Frog. This is on a suburban block surrounded by other houses with people in them. But no, it's just these schmucks, now acquainted by a redhead version of Annie from Community. Thank you, Dan Harmon. The kids devise a scheme to get the house to sleep and figure out how to kill it with a dummy filled with cold syrup. Um, points for creativity? And you're not gonna believe how they are able to figure this all out. A cameo brought to us by Napoleon Dynamite. Calm down, you make me want to throw up in some tinfoil and eat it. Yeah, remember how John Heater played that nerd with a perm and an aggressive attitude? Well, we can thank God this film isn't exploiting that role. Freaking idiot! So after our taxpaying dollars are put to waste and the house consumes the police along with the kids, we eventually discover that the house has a connection to Nebacracker. Turns out the house is animated through the spirit of his long lost wife when she was accidentally laid in the foundation after some kids were annoying them. I'll be honest, but this is where some of the strength of the film has going for it. We eventually find out that TJ didn't kill Nebacracker, as mentioned before, and explains his relationship with his life before her soul passed on to shingles and flooring. She's played by Kathleen Turner of all people. It also justifies Nebacracker's hatred towards children, since they're similar to the brats leading to his wife's death. We get to see Buscemi's acting chops go from an angry coot to a somewhat tragic character who has to make the choice of letting go of his true love. It almost seems inappropriate since it's featured in this film, you know, with the lame jokes and this blithering idiot. Heck, we even get the cliched scene in kids movies where there's a giant brawl between the characters and the house after he realizes that she's turned flat out evil. Oh come on, there's no way a town that can't notice this going on unless they're all blind, deaf, and dumb. There's a giant Sentinian house parading the streets. Seriously, they could be joined by Godzilla and King Kong and nobody would bat an eye. So in a scene that was foreshadowed earlier, Chowder operates some heavy machinery and TJ throws a stick of dynamite into the house. Right after kissing the girl. Well, I can't complain about the ambulance tropes without having a forced love interest. So Nebacracker gets a change in heart after letting his wife go. TJ and his friends go trick-or-treating and... In a disappointing cop-out, every victim of the house somehow lived through all this mayhem. Well, I guess they had to keep their PG rating. Here we go from a movie that grows a pair of nuts, and then retracts them, leaving us with this awkward Halloween schlock. I can understand the filmmakers wanting to make a mature movie for the young adults, but if you're gonna do it, go all the way. I guess it would take a couple of years and a small stop-motion studio from Oregon to get it right. Specifically with the film's message. Whereas you have a victim of bullying who comes back from the grave to exact the revenge, it leaves you with a message on how finding acceptance, even through hate, can be a hard dish to swallow. However, when the film attempts that similar message, there's the kids who want to grow up and not be treated like children and trick-or-treating and whatever. If you're gonna have the anti-bullying message, stick it all the way like Paranorman did. Don't try to put in the contrived coming-of-age fuddy-duddy story. While this is an image movers film, this is one that doesn't focus on realism as their other projects do. There's more attention to making the characters appear like stop motion puppets. However, the drawback is that it's still motion capture, and looks more like kids wearing really thick latex masks taking away most of their expression, especially with the way they move in relation to the environment. Some like to argue that motion capture takes away from the animator's work, where they have more work on interpreting a performance. However, it's clear that the guys at Image Movers may rely too much on the data with a lack of interpretation that leads me to believe that these animators working on this just sort of went... We have technology! <laughs> this is clearly a movie that comes so close and yet so far. I can see why people admire this film and probably paved the way for more risk-taking films like Paranorman. However, I'm not one that can really admit to enjoying this that much. Other than a performance by Steve Buscemi, you may want to skip this one like most of Image Movers movies. So my question for today, what is your favorite motion capture character or film mostly using the motion capture technique? For me, I've been watching the new Planet of the Apes movies and I gotta say, Caesar or Koba is one of my favorite characters in motion capture. Now I'm Joey Tedesco and I hope you guys had a safe Halloween.